It's 1115 on 1210 WCAU. Gloria Steinem is here, and I was, as I was saying, Gloria is one of this country's most widely read and critically acclaimed writers and editors. Most of her time is spent as writer and editor for Ms. Magazine, which she helped found in 1972. Seems hard to believe that it could be 1972. It seems so far away. But she's taken a little time out of her busy schedule to talk about her second book, Marilyn Norma Jean. She wrote the text, and the pictures are from George Barris. Uh, never before published pictures, uh, probably the last photos ever taken of Marilyn Monroe, uh, before her tragic death in 1962. So welcome, Gloria. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you. They want you to get a little closer here. We have okay. the oldest mics in the world. We're going to take these right to the Smithsonian when we're through here. The book was started by photographer George Barris, but it was delayed for a long time. Uh, why was that, and then how did you get involved in this? George Barris had been taking these photographs in the last summer of Marilyn's life, and they were going to do a collaborative book together, uh, uh, an autobiographical book. After her death, George, who's a very kind and sen sensitive man, was really, it, it really kind of devastated him, and, and, uh, and I, if other things were happening politically. He, he, anyway, he went to Paris, and he met a woman there, fell in love, had two daughters, raised the daughters, and he just never did anything with his notes from the interviews or from or with those photographs. And uh, my publisher, Henry Holt, called me and said that they, they had access because uh, George Barris had come back to this country to live and suggested that I consider doing the text because um, no woman had ever written a book, or at least not one of the substantial books about Marilyn. That's an odd thing, too. Over 40 books have been written, and yet nearly all of them, or if not all of them, by men. You must have a theory about that. <laughs> Why do you think that... Well, it, it, during her lifetime, she also said that her... She said, sadly, that her fame was almost a totally male phenomenon, and that women felt uh, hostile or competitive toward her, and I think that that was largely true. Um, until her death made us realize how unhappy she really was, and perhaps more to the point, the, the women's movement, or whatever you want to call this kind of great sea change for women, came along, and, and we began to rethink our own roles, and therefore to see that the role she was playing was one that she really didn't have a lot of choice about. That is, if you wanted to be a movie star, you know, as a young woman, you really had to play those kinds of roles and, those, and, and be that person. And she was willing to go through what it took to be able to work. Not, yes. Not so that, uh, you made a good point that she didn't, uh, she didn't do these things so that she, with these men or whatever so she didn't have to work. She did these things so she could work, mm -hmm. which is a difference. It gets you to see that she felt as though this was the only way she right, would what, be what, accepted. I mean, she was, I mean, you know, what you're referring to is not only her image, but also the fact that, that she slept with producers or, I mean, slept with is even a dignified word for what, uh, you know, lots of <laughs> yes, starless Yes, it's a nice word. way to say yeah, it, right. right. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, then the, the irony is, of course, that then the victim is accused of using sex to get ahead. But, of course, it's now what we would call sexual harassment because right. she was forced to do that or else she couldn't get couldn't the job. Couldn't get the job, right. So it wasn't do she wasn't doing it, as you point out, instead of working, but in order to be able to work. She felt as though she had to. So many people still feel so strongly, uh, more than ever, about Marilyn Monroe, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners would like to call in and discuss it along with us. So if you'd like to call in and talk to Gloria about Marilyn Monroe, the things that she's found out through her research, and maybe we can discuss some of the myths about Marilyn, some of the things that you've always heard, but you want to find out if it is perhaps true or not. A lot of things have been written about her. We know you'd all like to help us discuss it. So give us a call. From Philadelphia, the number is 839-1210. And from South Jersey, 541-1210. I'm Anita. We'll be back with Gloria Steinem. The time on 1210 WCAU is 1120. I've visited Philadelphia. It's 1122 on 1210 WCAU. Gloria Steinem is here, and she's got a brand new book called Marilyn Norma Jean, which is her text. Different things in a man. I mean, she never married for money and wouldn't have ever marry for money, which was a point that you made. Why do you think she chose the men that she chose as her husband? been uh, were they father figures or was it more mm -hmm. was it more than that she was married three times and the first time was when she was uh, 16 indeed the marriage was arranged when she was 15 and they would just waited until after her birthday to make it legal who arranged this? arranged not by her uh -huh. but by but by Norma Jean as, as she was then known by her legal guardian otherwise she would have had to go back to an orphanage 
because there was really no one to look after she her. She never had a real, she never any had a real family, family or any no. time. Yeah. No, and I think that's the key, and, and she thought that it was very clear that that was the key to the men she chose because she was always looking for a family, looking for a father. She ch she called all three of her husbands daddy or dad, mm. you know, some pa, some yeah. version of father. Um, and uh, after her divorce from this first husband, who was, seems to have been a nice, ordinary yeah. guy who was, you know, looking after her, and except he, he, he went off to the Merchant Marine, and that seemed to her like another desertion, because she was so terrified of being deserted again, as she had been as a, as a little girl. Um, they gradually separated, and she began to work as an actress in a... Or as a model first and then an actress. But she wanted, I mean, having never had anybody focus on her totally as a little, as a baby or a little girl, as a, as a loving parent, she came to feel she didn't exist, you know, that she wasn't visible. I mean, that's what happens to kids who don't have that kind of loving attention. And always, she always was a child in a sense. Yes. Uh, inside, also her life. And inside. loved children so much. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about... Uh, the uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, let's see, I had it down here, What it's called something, the Children's... The Children's Fund. The Children's Fund, and yeah. that's set up for her. Your f Is part of your fee in Georgia, the whole book is for this, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes, because I thought, you know, so many people profiteered off Marilyn while she was alive. She was the end of the contract system of players, so actually she made very little money. That's a myth people might want. Not mm -hmm. She was not a wealthy not actress. at all. Not at all. She she was getting a uh, hundred thousand dollars a a picture at a time when Elizabeth Taylor was getting a million, and Marilyn also felt bad and kind of victimized by that. And she was also, uh, you know, helping to support the uh, Arthur Miller, you know, she her living uh, establishment right. with Arthur Miller, and she she really never had that much money. In fact, just before she died, she had bought a very modest house, and she was so proud of it. It was the first thing of her own that she she'd ever owned. And yet, to some, she was the only star, mm -hmm. not just the biggest star. She was the only one, and any everyone else was merely copying. Yeah, well, I th I think that's that's true too. She was a unique combination. But but in any case, I uh, given that fact, and and the more I learned about her childhood and and how much she was. Continue, continued to be trapped in that pattern, you know, in, in the way that we sometimes continue to treat ourselves the way we were treated as children. And she neglected herself and was terribly insecure and was looking for fathers in her husbands and so on. Um, and had been sexually abused as a kid. And the more I thought that it just made sense to give money to something that she would have wanted to give money to. Yeah. So we, we created a, a, a children's fund inside the um, Miss Foundation for Women. And it's wonderful. And it will go especially to sexually abused kids and neglected kids. A lot of people might be wondering your con how, what connection you feel to, for, to Marilyn Monroe because you you woke us up i mean you she had a uh, the kind of life it would seem you had the antithesis mm -hmm. why what kind of connection do you feel i feel a very strong connection i mean i think that we most of us experience similar kinds of things the question is degree and the question is how much strength we have to resist i mean marilyn because of her childhood really didn't have that much strength and she never finished high school she didn't have very many tools to you know be the person she might otherwise have been. Yeah. She wanted to be a lawyer, for instance. I mean, she would talk about, you know, as a teenager, where did that come from? I mean, she's a working class kid yeah. from a poor she district never even in met Los a Angeles. Yeah, yeah, but somehow, and certainly there were almost no women lawyers at that point, yet she was talking about going to New York and going to law school. So, you know, she had all these other ambitions. She wanted to be an educated person. She would just read indiscriminately without guidance because she was trying so hard to to educate her herself. She tried hard to do a lot of things to break away from the very image that brought her to the attention of the public and that's always a tricky thing to do because if it's working for you then to turn around and say yeah but I'm not really like this it's mm -hmm. as if they didn't get it at, at all mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. first. Do you think now I mean there's so many now you can sit back and think because well, she, she would have been 60 right on yes. in last July? June in first. last June okay mm -hmm. You think about what she could have been. Do you think she would have ever have been accepted or treated as a serious actress, as the serious person that she wanted to be? 
Well, I don't know. I, I certainly she that's what she wanted, uh, and she hoped to live to be a, a, a character actress and play wonderful parts. And uh, you know, she would talk about this, but she would have had to survive this youthful image, which was such a prison, uh. because you just it's perishable. I mean, you just it, everybody gets however older. However bad or good it may be at that moment in time, it certainly doesn't last. And she was more afraid of of aging even than death for hmm. that for that reason. Her death is probably more talked about than her life and more mystery involved. Yeah, that's a problem too. Yeah. I mean that's that was another reason I got hooked on on doing this book because I all of those other books, well, you know, many of them are several of them are very well researched and full of facts. But most of them are either movie star bios, mm -hmm. you know, from when she was alive. Or the more recent ones focus on her death and the Kennedy connection, right. but not on her life. That's right. And I thought, but who was Norma Jean? I mean, even in death, you know, she, we're not knowing who this person inside really was. And it was like a detective story for me, you know, trying to find this real person. We'll take a short break. Maybe you could tell us when we come back how you did find out so much about her childhood and who you spoke to, who you interviewed. And if you out there would like to know, I know there's a lot of mystery surrounding Marilyn Monroe's life and death. And give us a call. Anything you want to talk about, ask Gloria about, about Marilyn Monroe or anything else. Gloria Steinem is here, and uh, we would appreciate it and uh, encourage you to give us a call and join in our conversation about Marilyn Monroe. From Philadelphia, 839-1210. From South Jersey, 541-1210. I'm Anita. It's 1129, and you're listening back. It's 1131 on 1210 WCAU. I'm Anita, and my guest this hour is Gloria Steinem, and uh, she's written a book about Marilyn Monroe, Norma Jean, and more or less perhaps maybe trying to understand her than anything else uh, for the maybe one of the first times i've read a lot of things about Marilyn monroe and they'll give you those facts and they'll tell you who but they never try to tell you why or look within mm -hmm. Marilyn monroe mm -hmm. and i know you've you've tried to do that and i think you you did about reading it you do try to understand her she was a victim right i mean yeah, she was a, well I, I you know so many people have this misunderstanding that feminism is about being a victim that I hasten to say that it's about not being a victim it's about, about refusing to be a victim feminism yes yes and 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 she uh, in many ways did the very best she could I mean she became an extraordinary star in spite of these uh, wrenching insecurities that meant that she she was late because she was terrified and mm -hmm. she took drugs because she was terrified and she she would stand outside the studio and 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 throw up literally from from fear of performing on the set she must have had a lot of friends and this is the old question they ask they ask this about john belushi they ask this about every young person uh, that dies or or in some way uh, is self-destructive because of whatever couldn't anybody get through to her? Couldn't anyone help her? She was so loved. These doctors, after she tried to mm -hmm. commit suicide, they still gave her sleeping pills. They gave her, uh, uh, both the, the studios probably, and certainly the doctors gave her lots of tranquilizers and sleeping pills, which, you know, she was wildly over-medicated. Uh, in a way, again, I mean, what happened to her happens and uh, did happen more and still happens some to a lot of women but it hap it was a question of degree it was and it all happened to her yeah. so i mean even as we speak women are still being given 85 percent of all the tranquilizer prescriptions because you know if there's something wrong with us it must be in our head or we can do our work tranquilized because it's only women's work after they should all. calm so, down right right, right. <laughs> so you know it, she it, it, she was an exaggeration of what many of us uh, ex experience and uh, she also experienced Freudian influenced uh, therapy Wow! Now, so. now here's a woman who was actually sexually attacked in her childhood who was was getting therapy from from uh, Freudian therapists who may well have been influenced by Freud's firm and and uh, you know how shall I say hypocritical um, theory that that uh, little girls haven't really been sexually attacked because of course fathers would never do that it's just that they they behave seductively it's the seduction theory so they it was they imagined it because they wanted to seduce their fathers can you imagine going no, I, no. to an analyst that's you know, all she the, needed to hear that, right and um, there's a, a frightening statistic about one in six adult women have been sexually assaulted that's in their very, childhood that's very conservative statistic is right? it mm -hmm. and so some there, people say one in four so therefore all these women that perhaps have never been able to, I guess, uh, get any help for themselves, mm. might feel a little bit, or might have a little bit more, uh, I guess, um, 
reluctance. I mean, they'll go out, they'll speak out now, or they'll attack yes, the problem. Because, because, because women are supporting each other enough so that we're trying to tell the truth. We say this unsayable thing that we think happened only to us, and then we hear six other women in the room say, oh, I thought, you know... That only happened, happened to, me, to too. me, yeah. And then you begin to see that, that the problem is not only an individual problem, but it's also a, a society-wide problem. You know, that, 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 that men, through no fault of men's either, but they're raised to believe that they uh, need to be dominant over, over females in order to be real men, and if they can't dominate adult women, they'll dominate kids. You know, so there is this extraordinary... Uh, almost drug addiction on the part of some men to 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 you know they don't feel like they're real men unless they're dominating being sexually yeah. dominant over some female even if it's a, a little girl and that's what happened to Marilyn. Give us a call from Philadelphia with your questions and comments for Gloria Steinem eight three nine twelve ten from Philadelphia from South Jersey five four one twelve ten. You uh, you did some remarkable research traced back uh, till till she was a baby. I mean you had her baby picture. Where did you get it? Who did you interview? And how did you verify this information? Well, for, first I just read uh, everything I could lay my hands on, which is an extraordinary amount of material. I've never written about anybody who has been so written about. <laughs> and the interesting thing was, I mean, for the most part, these were bios with, with just a couple of exceptions. They were bios really m done to make money and done very hastily. So each person had done some part of the research, and one would ask one question, and then in the other book you'd find the answer, <laughs> you know. So it was really like a detective story. Right. Um, then there are a lot of people who have collected Marilyn memorabilia, so, so uh, you know, I would get, try to search out photographs through with their help. Um, and then I interviewed people who, especially people who had known her casually and didn't have a kind of investment in seeing right. her one way or the other. And fortunately, I also had a kind of deep throat. I mean, that is, right. uh, I, I had a, a woman who had known her very, very well, who has never been interviewed for attribution, uh -huh. and who, who agreed to, to sort of guide me. I mean, I would send her chapter by chapter, and she would tell me whether I was going off the track or not. I'm so glad that George Barris, as you probably are, agreed to uh, finally publish these pictures. Uh, when I looked through them, I felt really sad. Uh, at this particular point in her life, was she happy or was she sad? I know you say she had some projects that she wanted to do. Or maybe you could tell us a little bit more about them. Was she happy at this point uh, when these photographs were taken, these ones right before? No, no, she wasn't at all. And at first when I went over George's notes, which he had kept all these years, at first I was a little mystified because she kept saying, she kept protesting things that were clearly untrue. You know, I'm, I'm fine, I'm, uh, you know, I'm ready to work. I mean, now this is a woman who can't sleep, who's addicted, who's ill, who's, you know, and she's protesting that she's fine. Um, she's, she's even, uh, you know, saying uh, th things about her, her background, which, which are patently true, were, were not true. Changing you know. things. And right. Yeah. Uh, but, but the minute she started, in the notes, the minute she started to talk about her childhood, you realize that she get, would get back into the unhappiness of it. So it, uh, it finally became very clear that what she was doing with this biography that she was doing with George was to try to get her job back. She'd been fired from the last movie. She was rumored to be unemployable. She was terrified that she would never work again. So she was doing this combination of protesting too much. I'm fine, everything's terrific, and so on. And then at the same time getting off into very depressed, um, kind of, uh, how shall I say, irresistible memories of, of, of her childhood and, and that really betrayed her, her feelings. So she was kind of mixed up and definitely not well, happy. She, well, not no. mixed up, but she was manipulating... She was Right, she was trying, she was desperate. I, see. I mean, I would say she, she was, was just desperate. desperately trying to get her job back, trying to hang on to the, the one thing in her life that, that had made her visible to the world, which was this work as an actress. She was then 36 years old and terrified that, you know, that was already that pretty old for, for, for an her. actress in those days. She was um, trying desperately, she had tried for years to get away from the dumb blonde roles, yet she had been cast in one more dumb blonde role. Uh, and and by the end of her life, she was def desperate to get that back. You know, yeah. uh, she was divorced from Arthur Miller. She was uh, pretty much isolated and alone in this little house that she'd bought. What broke up their marriage? Just the fact that it was Arthur Miller and Marilyn, or d uh, just the I well. Mean Again, I, I hasten to, you know, I don't want to be a writer who pretends to know everything. Right, of course not. There you know, and there I, couldn't I mean, have been just one answer for that either. I, I right. yeah, but I. 
I, it seems pretty clear that they each married an image. You know, that she, she wanted, she desperately wanted to be taken seriously. And she would say, please don't make me a joke. You know, please write about what I really believe in and so on. And this desperation to be taken seriously uh, clearly, you know, was at least one of the major reasons why she married America's most serious playwright. <laughs> you know, because... Th th sure. that. And she was Mrs. Arthur and Miller. And he was, and he was also a wonderful father figure. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, but, but then you get this, you know, this serious, rather traditional, uh, very egocentric uh, writer, who's married to a wildly insecure, um, very non-traditional, uh, very talented, very searching kind of woman who mm -hmm. he may have married. Who knows? Big, you know, who knows because what, she yeah. was. You know, a movie star, and he right. was fascinated. I mean, as most or I many guess, men were, yeah. with this kind of child woman who seemed to offer infinite sexual reward without any of the challenge of an adult woman. It, you know, just total approval, total giving to you know, which of course is impossible. Right. But that's what. <laughs> that's what. Know, yeah. That's what it men appeared. Are, society right. tells men to uh, to expect. expect. Right. So it it seems to have been doomed from the very beginning, and she certainly tried to commit suicide several times during their marriage. Oh, my. Well, we'll come back and talk more about Marilyn Monroe with Gloria Steinem. Give us a call if you'd like a, to comment or question anything that you ever heard about Marilyn Monroe. Uh, we'll talk about the Kennedy rumor. Uh, we have to bring that up about whether or not, in fact, perhaps uh, the Kennedys were involved. Maybe even uh, Marilyn Monroe spending one of her last nights with Bobby Kennedy. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa has been uh, linked into this. We'll talk about all of that when we come back with Gloria Steinem. The number to call from Philadelphia, 839-1210. From South Jersey, 541-1210. I'm Anita. The time is 1141. Welcome back. I'm Anita. It's 1144 on 1210 WCAU. Gloria Steinem is here, and you can meet Gloria. She'll be uh, signing her book at Barnes & Noble on 14th and Chestnut Streets between 1230 and 2 p.m. this afternoon. So make sure you get down there and meet Gloria at Barnes & Noble's 14th and Chestnut, 1230 to 2 p.m. this afternoon. And uh, I'm sure that you enjoy getting out meeting the people. I do really enjoy it. You know, m authors don't do this so much anymore because it's kind of old-fashioned, you, you know, to, to do signings. And obviously you're supposed to do television. Right, and right. But I, I, I really like it because people come and tell you the most interesting things, you know, little pieces of... I think it's partly because uh, the women's movement has meant a lot and changed a lot of lives, so... so just because I am accidentally a recognizable <laughs> part of it, wow. I get treated to all these little novels, you know, yeah. and I learn so much. It's really interesting. Well, that's great. I'm sure a lot of people will be down there today to meet you. And we've got Steve from North Philadelphia who's called up to talk about Marilyn Monroe. Thanks, Steve, for calling 1210 WCAU. Hi. Hi, Anita. How are you? Hello to Gloria Steinem. Hello. I want to ask, I'm not sure if it was about in, in Marilyn or in society that I mean, I took her seriously as one of the great uh, screen comedians. And, you know, I mean, I didn't... How, how old are you? I'm 32. Well, it's interesting, in fact, that the, I think... The, I remember this is pretty distinctly. The first year that movies started being shown on television, mm -hmm. they showed, I think, just about all of her big movies. Mm -hmm. The first year on the network, and like in a block, they bought a block of them. And How to Marry a Millionaire and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. I mean, all those movies, Seven Year Rich, some like how we're all on in one year. Mm-hmm. I started watching them that, then, and just let, a couple weeks ago, Seven Year Rich was on, I watched it again. And this is a great comic actress. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with you, and, and I think she is taken much more seriously now for her work. Uh, but at the time those movies came out, it was much more the sort of sex, dumb blonde kind of image that was the dominant one than it than this than the serious actress who was able to to do comedy in a wonderfully spontaneous way. I mean, the irony is that she probably didn't have that many people in her life who said to her what you're saying now. Right. Nobody said, "Oh, she's smart enough to play dumb," or "Don't worry, Marilyn, we they get the joke." That she really was dumb. Right. They, right. That she, I mean, she's, she made a couple like. Uh, in quote serious performances like Bus Stop. Yes, right. Uh, but, and bus, stop, bus Stop was very important for her because that was after she had been going to the actor's studio and she really made an effort to dictate that role and she insisted on having realistic costumes and a different kind of makeup and, you know, she really shaped a lot of that herself. I mean, is it, I, mean I personally wouldn't want to particularly have seen the Marilyn Monroe playing Lady Macbeth. 
mad right. that was necessary. So you think she was pretty well cast, and you don't, and you don't understand. I mean, when you, saw, you ever see John Wayne playing Genghis Khan? So in other words, what it, what did she really expect? Like she had the serious films like Bus Stop. I guess she mm -hmm. wanted more of those. I, well, I, she, I, she did. Was it, her, was it something is it something you can trace back in her, or is it just as you said she didn't have enough people around telling her that what she was doing she was the best at? Well, I, it was a mix of things. I think uh, both that she didn't have enough people in the present, and people just assumed that she was as dumb as she was playing in those roles. But perhaps even more importantly, that she just didn't have any self confidence because of the way she had grown up. It's I mean, so hard to imagine being Marilyn Monroe, and I know I know what Steve means because you want to say Marilyn. Mm -hmm. You, you got it all, you know, have a good time, Do you, you know, everybody loves you, you're beautiful, you're, you're Marilyn Monroe, why? Mm -hmm. But yet, she couldn't... Well, I think we all, we all experience a little bit of this ourselves, and we all know people who experience it a lot, you know, p people who are very different inside from their outsides, and just uh, always feel like imposters. In fact, there was even a book written, uh, you know, about the imposter phenomenon mm -hmm. that you you feel like you're you're deceiving people that really you're worthless no matter you know almost no matter what kind of recognition you get you still don't feel that it's deserved and certainly Marilyn was like that I mean even even after all the successes uh, she would say things like you know I I can't have children I'm I can't cook what man would want me <sighs> she would get you, you know because yeah <laughs> right I but it's still you, you it's it's hard to imagine isn't it Steve that she could have been Marilyn Monroe and still been that insecure you know, uh, I don't know how much... Do uh, you know about uh, Judy Holliday, for example? She played the same type of roles. Do you know if she was similarly uh, played by self-doubt or uh, feelings of self not as Not as much, uh, uh, I don't believe, as, as Marilyn. I mean, Judy had had a somewhat m more secure childhood. Yeah, that's really the key, too. You have to remember, she, yeah. She, she was, was like fearful of her work, Judy, and she was Garland, apparently, and got off into, you know, combinations of drugs and, and alcohol in order, you know, fearful that she couldn't produce this kind of spontaneity again, and certainly as a child star, you know, she had also su suffered in various ways, and her weight had been manipulated up and down, and she had to le lead this totally public life, and so on. But at least she had a mother, mm -hmm. you know, who, I mean, at least she had one loving parent, and Marilyn didn't even have that. You feel the way I do it, uh, since, I mean, since she died, there have been a lot of books, a lot of people, almost, who were there at that time. I mean, obviously, you're Gloria Steinem, so you're not trying to make a name off of Marilyn Monroe. But there seemed to be a lot of people who were there at the time who are now saying, well, of course, she and I were good friends. Sure. She was the only one I could... Conf who I was oh, right. Yeah, you hear that. But apparently, I mean, all these people, they were actually never around. Right. And, <laughs> and uh, was it, again, part of uh, Marilyn's life that uh, she also had trouble, you know, getting people to stay around her? Or is it just... That in fact, Hollywood is just she was just a commodity, or again, I trust probably a combination of both, I guess. Yeah, I think. I mean, um, w one of the books that that helped me the most when I was when I was doing this research was not about Marilyn at all. It's it's uh, a book called Your Inner Child of the Past by a child psychologist, Hugh Misseldine, and he, in very simple language, just explains the kind of free the common excesses of child rearing. And, and, you know, too much discipline, whatever. And, and when he talks about the neglected child, the very seriously neglected child, and how that person grows up, it absolutely turns out to be Marilyn. Hmm. In other words, if you've never had the experience of being intimate with someone when you are a baby and a, chi and a little child, it's very hard for you to create intimacy with anyone as a grown-up. When you grow, you And yet you desperately want it, but you don't know well, how, how to it. do it. So, yeah, and, and, uh, that was very much Marilyn. How does her life is? I mean, her one triumph, if you want to say that, 100, 200, 300 years from now, as long as people are watching movies, I think her her value as an actress, I think, will grow and grow. And mm -hmm. 300 years from now, people will recognize her. As well, yes, we, we I hope think, so. I think you're right. Her films, and they'll forget, you know, and maybe they, I mean, they shouldn't forget necessarily, but, you know, they'll remember her mainly for being just a great... Well. 
We I hope so. I hope you're Th right. Thank you, Steve, for your call. We're going to take a break and come back with Gloria Steinem. The time is 11.52. Gloria, thank you. Unbelievably enough, we're out of time. And I just I wanted to thank you for coming by and remind everybody that you will be at the Barnes & Nobles on 14th and Chestnut from 12.30 till 2 p.m. this afternoon signing your new book. And thanks so much. Oh, thank you much. Thank you very much. You made it very nice. It all went so quickly. It did. It went too fast. <laughs> I keep looking at the clock saying, are you sure it's this late? But it is, they tell us. So thank you. And I hope we meet again. I hope so.